grab your seat and open with me to Mark chapter 7. We'll be looking this morning at verses 14 through 23, which is really kind of the second part of the passage that we studied two weeks ago. So I have to do a little bit of remembering in order to kind of connect the pieces from there, but I think we'll be able to do it. Verses 14 through 23. While you're turning there, I want to tell you a story that a friend of mine in college told me that has always stuck with me. Uh, She told the story that apparently as a child, she was somewhat of a handful, um, and that when there were a couple times at church that in worship she was being distracting or disruptive, and so her parents would go to take her out of the service so they could get onto her, and then she would start screaming at the top of her lungs, Jesus made me do it! Jesus made me do it! And they would try to explain, no, 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 you mean like Satan was like tempting you? No, no, Jesus made me do it. Which is quite the trump card for like a six-year-old to pull. Like, no, the, the God of the universe told me to do it, right? And uh, the first thing that sticks out to me about that story is it's always funny when it's somebody else's kid, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty funny unless it's you and your kid, and in which case you, you want to evaporate in that moment. But the second thing that I think that shows us is it's a pretty honest reflection of human nature, which is if we can in any way pass the blame or put an excuse for our bad behavior on someone else, we will take that opportunity. We like this idea of being able to uh, say, it's not our fault, I was forced to do it. We, we think especially about our sin and we go, well, yeah, I, I messed up, but, you know, I was tempted by the world, or I was put in a hard circumstance or a difficult situation, or this person, they didn't fulfill their end of the bargain. And so we come up with all these excuses where we want to pass the blame and say, because of something from outside of me, that is the reason for my sin. And the hard truth that we're going to have to wrestle with this morning is Jesus is going to teach us the exact opposite of that. That the source of our sin is not something that is outside of us. It is actually something that is inside of us. And so this is really, as I said, a continuation of Jesus when he was, had this interaction with the Pharisees. They came to him and they said, hey, Jesus, we've noticed that your disciples, they don't wash their hands following this tradition that has been passed down now for a long time. That this is a certain purity code that we have an expectation of. And so really, it was not much of a question. It was more of an accusation. Jesus, why don't you and your disciples do this? And rather than answering their question about purity and impurity, he addressed um, what was going on inside of them. He said, really, the, the source of your question comes from your hypocrisy, that though you have this outward demonstration of holiness, though you pr- uh, proclaim to worship God with your lips, something very different is happening inside of you. There's a disconnect between your lips and your heart. And so then after having addressed that issue of hypocrisy, Jesus then turns to the crowd to actually answer the original question about defilement or impurity. And that is where we pick up in verse 14. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. So we're going to hear Jesus Uh, call for understanding twice in this passage, which is a clear indication that what he's about to teach us, the main issue is a lack of understanding, that there's a confusion about the topic that Jesus is going to address. Let's see what that topic is. Verse 15, he said, there's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. All right, so this simple little teaching would have been incredibly shocking to Jesus' audience. They would have been stunned that he said this. And it makes sense that he's addressing this question. The the Pharisees, ultimately, that's what they were asking about. Hey, we're worried that because we're eating, even though we're eating clean food, according to the Old Testament law, if we eat clean food with unclean hands, is that not going to cause an impurity, a defilement for us? So that's the kind of the, 
the general topic that they're asking about. And Jesus then says, you're confused. You've got it backwards. There's nothing that you can eat or take into your body that is going to cause you to be defiled. Now, up to this point, we have seen Jesus have a lot of conflict with the teaching of the Pharisees, which ultimately was not um, the Old Testament law. They were teaching uh, additional rules added on to the Old Testament law. They had this idea that, well, we don't want to break the laws that God has given us, so we're going to add extra rules to create space between us and the Old Testament laws. And so Jesus, up to this point, has largely been saying, I've got problems with these extra rules that you've come up with. But here, this that he has just said, there's nothing outside of you that he can take into you that will defile you. This not only appears to, to contradict the Pharisees' additional rules, but this appears at first glance to directly contradict the Old Testament law additionally. I mean, listen to Leviticus 11.43. I'll read it for you. You shall not make yourselves detestable with any swarming thing that swarms. So this is the end of a chapter that is a long list of what kind of foods you should eat or should not eat, which animals are clean and which animals are not clean, okay? And at the long list, don't eat any of these detestable swarming things. You shall not defile yourselves with them and become unclean through them. So here, at first glance, it seems like Jesus is not just arguing with the Pharisees' extra rules. It seems like he's contradicting the Old Testament law. So what in the world is going on? Well, let's keep reading, because what we see is that apparently the disciples didn't understand either. Verse 17, And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. Now, that's an interesting description of Jesus' teaching, because it's not the kind of parable that we would expect. It sounds like he's just giving a a, a straight-up regular teaching, right? But he's going to unpack his teaching, and we're going to see there is a metaphorical level to what he's talking about. Verse 18, And he said to them, Then you are also without understanding? So here, what we understand from this is that Jesus was not correcting or contradicting the Old Testament law. Instead, he's saying, you have the wrong understanding about the Old Testament law. What needs to be corrected is how you view it. There's nothing wrong with the Old Testament law. It's not like God got it wrong, and now Jesus is coming along to fix his error. No, he's saying, you misunderstand the Old Testament law. Uh, And here's the correction. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside, cannot defile him. Well, why not, Jesus? It seems like that's what the Old Testament law is saying. If we eat these unclean foods, it will cause defilement, right? He says in verse 19, well, here's why. Because it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. So Jesus is drawing a a metaphor, a parable, from how the human body works the normal process of consumption and digestion and expulsion, right? That you eat something, and yes, it enters into you, but where does it go? It goes to your stomach, and it doesn't stay a part of you. It eventually leaves, right? We are all following, right? We all understand what Jesus is saying. And in that, there is a picture. He's saying this is helping you to understand the truth behind the Old Testament laws, What he's helping them to see is that each of those Old Testament laws were ultimately a teaching tool. They were symbolic, that there was nothing inherently different about uh, shellfish. Instead, there was a lesson behind why you don't eat shellfish. There's nothing inherently about Uh, inherently different about pork, but instead there was symbolism. And all of this symbolism becomes clear based on either cultural practices or either a symbolic lesson. This is actually a little bit clearer if I read to you that whole uh, section from Leviticus 11 instead of just one verse. So let's go back there, okay? Uh, Leviticus 11, 43 He says, you shall not make yourselves detestable with any swarming thing that swarms, and you shall not defile yourselves with them and become unclean through them. Well, why not, God? 
for I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. So at the end of the day, the entire Old Testament law was a tool for teaching that one very important truth. You be holy because I am holy. Now, let's understand God's holiness. He created all of those swarming things that he commanded the Jews not to eat, which is like, okay, God, I didn't really want to eat them anyway. That's pretty yucky. But, um, but you think, as you think of God's perfect holiness, and let's say he interacts with a swarming creature, is that going to infect or, or break his holiness in any way? No, there's nothing inherently different about this swarming creature versus this animal. There's nothing inherently different about, okay, don't eat a camel, but you can eat a horse, right? I mean, because that's one's unclean and one's clean. Camel meat is not inherently different, but there is a teaching tool, and, and we don't have time to go into all of the deep and rich, meaningful symbolism behind all of those laws but every single one of them was intended to remind the people every single day, hey, I'm holy, so that means if you're my people, you have to be holy tool too as well. So that meant there are times when they couldn't go to a pagan party because they're going to eat things that we're not supposed to eat. It is a way for them to be set apart. It is a way for them to be different and to be continuously reminded, God's holy, so we're going to be holy. And so we don't have time because each of those different laws has different kinds of symbolism, but they all teach that one lesson, a continuous reminder. I need to be holy because God is holy. So that is the heart behind the law and what the Pharisees had gotten wrong. And even what the disciples are wrestling with is they thought they were being made holy through the law but instead, the law was supposed to be teaching them about the holiness of God. They got it out of order. Meaning, doing those things did not inherently make them holy. Instead, it was a teaching tool about holiness. Okay? So, that's why they got it backwards. They got it out of order. And that was what Jesus needed to correct. And this was why, ultimately, he, in this moment, declared all foods clean. We see that that's in a parenthesis there, meaning that's not something Jesus said. and said, this is Mark giving some application for his original readers in the 50s AD. So Christians have been kind of wrestling with this for now 20 years after Jesus' ministry. Now, what does this mean about the law? And we've got Paul's writings, but do we see the same truths taught in Jesus' sayings? And, and, and Mark is saying, yeah, here it is. This is Paul and Jesus agreeing. What he's saying is that food, it was supposed to teach you something, not actually change the status of your holiness. And so what that means is if we, we drive to the heart of this issue, then we can understand the law completely differently. The author of Hebrews draws a, a, a similar idea in chapter 10, verse 4, when he said, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Meaning, if you look at the Old Testament the wrong way, you would think, well, there must be something special about the blood of a bull or a goat compared to the blood of a horse. Like, those animals somehow have magical blood that can remove sin. You go, no, that's, that's silly. That's misunderstanding it entirely. The blood of those sacrifices was always supposed to be a teaching tool. It was always supposed to be a demonstration of the person who offered the sacrifice, their genuine repentance. Lord, I recognize the seriousness of my sin. I'm the one who should be pouring out my blood right now because of my sin. It also represented their genuine faith. God, I trust that in your grace, you are willing to accept a substitute. And that's what this animal is. And what the author of Hebrews goes on to say is that blood didn't actually do anything. Instead, what was it teaching? It was pointing everyone towards the blood that can actually take away sin, which is Jesus' blood. So do you see the, the way that both of those things 
work the same way. They're both teaching and pointing to a deeper, more meaningful truth. And so here's the issue that the Pharisees had. They thought that it didn't really matter that there was a disconnect between their heart and their lips. They thought they were making themselves holy because of their external obedience to these laws. And Jesus says, you're hypocrites. You're just putting on a show. There's a disconnect between what's happening on the outside and what's happening on the inside. And that is critically important. It's not insignificant. Because who, what kind of a God are we serving? Is he someone who only sees the outside of who we are? No. So ultimately what Jesus was warning the Pharisees about, warning his disciples about, warning the crowds about, and now warning us this morning is this. External obedience cannot satisfy the judge who knows our internal condition. That external obedience cannot satisfy the judge who knows our internal condition, which is our next point, or our first point this morning. As if we could fool him. We, we could trick him. Well, as long as, you know, it looks good on the outside. It, it makes me think of like, as a parent, your kids are sneaking treats that they shouldn't have, and you find the candy wrapper under the kid's bed. Or worse yet, you find there's still chocolate smeared on their face, or their tongue is still blue from the blue Jolly Ranger, and you're like, really? You, you thought you were going to get away with this? That's a pretty weak attempt at hiding your disobedience. And I think from God's perspective, we must seem like those foolish children think that we can cover over our sin with simple acts of external obedience. We're not hiding anything from him. I mean, we might be able to fool our neighbors or our friends or our coworkers or students. You might be able to fool your parents with these external acts of obedience, but you are not fooling God. There is nothing that is hidden from him. He sees to the core of who you are. He sees all the way to who you are. And so, I don't know, maybe you hear that statement and you think, man, God's being too hard on us. Shouldn't external obedience be enough? Does the internal really matter? Well, I want you to imagine there's a couple, uh, you know, husband and wife having a conversation. And the husband says, well, I, I want to find a way to serve you. I want to find a way to show you my love. So what can I do? And the wife says, okay, at night after the kids are in bed, together, let's clean up the house. Let's do the dishes. Let's kind of get things in a better shape. You know, okay. And the husband that evening, he goes to do that. But the whole time, he has a bad attitude. He's grumpy about it. He's being ugly about it. And at the end, he has this kind of like entitlement. Like, well, you really owe me something now because of what I did. Do you think, though he had external signs of obedience to that request, do you think the internal condition of his heart was insignificant or unimportant during that time? Do you think the wife would feel loved and appreciated in that moment? No, because the internal condition of your heart absolutely has a bearing over whether or not your external obedience means anything at all. And the same is true for God. He's not looking for weak, empty, shallow, superficial acts of obedience or love. He's looking for a kind of obedience that flows from who we are. Not the kind of obedience that tries to cover up who we are. And so, here's the thing, is even if by our willpower we are able to perform external acts of obedience, do you think that really impresses God? Do you think that changes how he sees you? Or do you think he cares more about what's happening on the inside of you? I mean, because I do think by willpower, people are able to, I don't know, stop bad habits and start good habits. But if you're doing that, all you're doing is you're addressing the symptom of your sickness and not the sickness itself. It's like you've got the flu, you've got all these body pains, so you're just going to take Tylenol. 
but you're not resting, you're not staying hydrated, you're not keeping warm. So you're, you're just addressing the symptom, and the sickness is continuing. Or, or even worse still, it's someone who has a serious heart condition, and, and they think, well, I'll just take blood thinners when they actually need a heart transplant. That is the sickness that we have, our soul sickness. It's all the way to our heart. It's all the way to the core of who we are. And God is not interested in us simply addressing the symptoms. He wants to see us completely changed. He wants to give us a new heart entirely. That's what we're going to see as we keep reading in this text. Verse 20 through 23. He said, Rather than what going into a person defiling you, it's this, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, meaning out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these things come from within, and they defile a person. And then after a list like that, which hits everybody in the room on multiple accounts, seems so silly to think, yeah, as long as I eat the right foods or I put on the right show, that's all God cares about. When clearly, he's much more interested in what is coming from inside of us to the outside. And so ultimately what Jesus is challenging us with is this. What's happening in your heart? That the external, Jesus is not saying it's unimportant, but he's saying it is meaningless unless it matches what's happening on the inside. And that the hard truth that we have to be willing to accept is this. Unrighteous actions are the product of an unrighteous heart. That unrighteous actions are the product of an unrighteous heart. One of the things I was excited about when, uh, about having kids was that I love when someone asks me a question and I know the answer and I get to answer it. It makes me happy, right? And I know that kids like to ask a lot of questions. And so I anticipated being able to answer a lot of questions. What I was unprepared for was how often children ask questions that don't have good answers. You go, I don't even understand what's happening in your brain right now. Uh, I'll give you an example. Layla and I were having an in-depth conversation about uh, mixed nuts. And I really like pecans. And she did not like pecans. And the question that she kept asking was, but why do you like pecans? But why do you like pecans? And I'm just thinking, there's no reason other than I like them. There's no good answer to this question. At the end of the day, the only answer I can give is, well, that's just who I am. I like pecans, right? And honestly, oftentimes that's the only answer we can give from a lot of the things we do. Why do you eat what you eat? Or why do you watch what you watch? Or why do you play the games you play? Or go and do the things that you do? Oftentimes, the only thing we can say is, well, that's just who I am. The very difficult truth that Jesus is challenging us with this morning is this. Why do you sin? Where does it come from? Turns out, that's just who we are. And I don't say that in a way to excuse it or say we don't need to worry about, well, that's just who I am. Jesus said that in a way to wreck us and to break our hearts. As much as we would love to blame our sin on everybody else, well, because the culture tempts me every day. Or because this person didn't hold up their end of the bargain. Or because this person was disrespectful to me. As as much as we would love to blame everyone else for our sin, the reality is it comes from us. It comes from the overflow of our hearts. 
Can you admit that? Can you admit that you actually want to sin? That you like wickedness? That you enjoy evil things? It's true of me. And I hate that it's true. But it is true of me. That I understand what Paul was talking about when he said, I do the very things I hate. I understand what he was talking about when he said, you know, I don't, do not gratify the desires of your flesh. That I find a wicked gratification in sin. Can you admit that that is true of you? Now maybe you're, you're thinking, I don't know, those are strong words, wickedness, evil. Yeah, I struggle with some things. Yeah, I'm not perfect. Yeah, I slip up. And what you're doing is you are watering down what Jesus has said. And you are trying to bring down God's holiness. Because the culture is not the standard. God's perfection is the standard. And when we try to minimize our sin and say, yeah, I don't know, evil, wicked, we are not seeing him in his perfection and his glory and his holiness. But when we begin to get a glimpse of his perfect righteousness, then we can see the true darkness in our own hearts. So rather than blaming everyone else about our anger or our covetousness or our impure eyes, we just have to admit No, I'm an adulterer in my heart. And when we're faced with that truth, we realize that we have to do something much more radical than simply stopping bad habits and starting good ones. We need God to transform us entirely from the inside to the outside. We need an entirely new heart, not just to address the symptoms but a heart transplant. It doesn't matter how good the paint job is if the engine is blown. Brother, sister, you got to know, your engine is blown. There is no goodness inherently in who you are. Regardless of what the outside shows, God sees to the inside. And so this is a difficult truth to wrestle with. An equally difficult truth is this. I cannot change my heart. As hard as I try, I can't do it. Now, I'll admit it. Plenty of people, by willpower, have stopped bad habits and started good habits. But that is not the same thing as changing your heart. Plenty of Christians, by uh, discipline and by spiritual growth, have seen a decrease of sin in their life. I hope that is the testimony for you. It doesn't happen quickly, but over five years, 10 years, 15 years, you look back and you go, yeah, the Holy Spirit's been working on me, and I am, in regard to this thing, sinning less than I was 15 years ago. But here's the thing. Even though I can say that's true of me, not to my credit, to only the credit of the Holy Spirit, you know what? I still want the sin. And I can't change my heart on that. That today, that if I'm scrolling through YouTube or or social media, and the algorithm knows that I'm a red-blooded American man, and a video comes up that my flesh wants to click on, but the Holy Spirit tells me, don't click on it. That today, I have more success over that sin than I did 15 years ago. But you know what I can't change? The fact that I still want to click on it. But God can do things that we cannot do. I hope you know that. That's the whole reason we're here. Is because we trust that he can do things that we cannot do. And that this is actually the kind of transformation and rescue that he has promised to do. That that's what we read earlier in the service from Ezekiel 36. He said, I will sprinkle 
clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all of your uncleanliness. From all of your idols, I will cleanse you. That defilement that comes from inside of you to the outside, I will clean it. How? Because I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. God has promised to give us the heart transplant that we need. And it is exactly through the work of the Holy Spirit. That when you place your faith in Jesus, when you come to him as Lord, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. And he puts that new heart inside of you. And that's how it gets there. And and so, I mean, this is what he promised when we were thinking about covenants. On Good Friday, we were talking about the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. And the Old Covenant was written on tablets of stone. And the New Covenant is written where? On the hearts of God's people. A completely different heart. And so, if you're here this morning, and you've never called upon Jesus as Lord and Savior, can you see how much you need that? Can you see that the only thing you're able to do is try to address the symptoms, and your soul sickness without Him will continue for all of eternity? If you call upon him, the Holy Spirit has promised to come into you and to give you a new heart. And that offer is available to you. But if you're a Christ follower here this morning, there are two things that I know that are true about you. Yes, the hard truth is that you still hunger for sin. But I also know this to be true about you. You hunger for holy things too. That didn't come from you. That came from the new heart that the Holy Spirit has put inside of you. And though God has saved us from the power of sin, we still live in the presence of sin. And so, which means there's a battle going on inside of every single Christian between your new heart and your old heart, between God's heart and your heart of sin and darkness. And I, this is kind of an old preacher cliche, but maybe it's old enough that it'll be new to some people. We could kind of think of it as there are two dogs inside of you that are fighting each other. And The question is, is the holy dog going to win or is the sinful dog going to win? Who's going to win today? Well, which dog have you been feeding? Because a starved dog is not good at fighting. Meaning, God has given you that new heart that you desperately needed. But is that how you're living your life? Is that where you're giving your focus and your attention? You actually have the opportunity to have obedience, external obedience, that has come from the right place, that flows from a new heart. You have the opportunity to, do, to have external obedience that means something as opposed to a, a, a fake show, a pretending obedience. So which heart are you feeding Which kind of obedience are you living in? Because God is able to work this kind of a miracle. He's able to transform who you are. He's able to give you an external obedience that matches an internal devotion. And that is the kind of lives that we are called to live. And that is the kind of life that we have an opportunity to live because of what he has done in us. And so, yes, we go through a battle every single day. And yes, it can be exhausting. You can get to the point where you go, I'm so tired of fighting with my flesh. I'm so tired of of not gratifying that sinful desire. But be encouraged because every single day you also have holy hungers. Where you go, yeah, I do want to be in God's presence. Yeah, I do want to make him smile with my life. Yeah, I do want to see his kingdom grow. So be encouraged by those holy hungers that the Holy Spirit has placed inside of you. And pursue those with your focus, with your life, with your dedication, and with your attention. And what you'll see 
is that as you give more blood to your new heart, the rest of your body is going to follow in obedience to that. We're going to have a time of response, which is going to be our chance to move how the Holy Spirit is leading us. And we're going to sing the song that we sang earlier, Give Us Your Heart. And the reason we're going to do that is because I don't have the power to change my heart, and neither do you. But God does. And not only does he have the power, but he has the desire as well. And so we're going to call out to him, God, keep doing it. Keep changing my heart. Keep giving me holy hungers. Keep giving me a a hatred for my sin. And he's going to keep doing it. But if you're here this morning and Jesus isn't your Lord, you haven't called upon him for salvation, then you don't have that new heart. And you cannot have any kind of external obedience that that pleases the eternal judge until you let him change your heart. And that can happen today. That can happen this morning. During this time of response, we'll have pastors down here in the front who are ready to to talk with you, to show you from his word, to, to, to show you how you can have this heart transplant that you so desperately need. Come and speak with us, and we'll, uh, we'll walk you through that process. But now I'm going to pray for us, and uh, the band is going to lead us in our time of response. Father, we're thankful for you.